Okay, thanks. I'm going to talk about some uh, work I've been doing with Tim Jones. And we've published a couple of papers with a third in preparation. Uh, um, but for, I'll go through a little of the history and results that have been obtained. The renormalizable quantum gravity starts with a, an action that looks like this, where this is the vial tensor, and this is scalar curvature, and this is the trace, traceless part of the Ricci tensor. Uh, so the history of this model theory is that it was shown to be renormalizable a long time ago, in 1977, by Kelly Stella. Mm -hmm. And it was shown a few years later by Fradkin and Seitlin that it was actually asymptotically free. That is, these couplings went to zero at high scale. Um, and they were the first to calculate the one loop beta functions. And then a few years later, Abramidi and Barvinsky also calculated the one loop beta functions. And they're the first ones to get them right. <laughs> Now, I say that because Fradkin Zeitlin made only one mistake in one factor, and it completely changed the conclusions. <laughs> they only got asymptotic freedom when this coupling had the wrong sign for convergence of the action if you take a Euclidean point of view. And People still call this, write this with the wrong sign. But they showed that the correct calculation, and that's been checked, uh, actually gives asymptotic freedom with the right sign. Then a number of people looked at what happens when you add matter to this theory. And it's also asymptotically free some of the time. By that, I mean all the couplings go to zero, not just these. And that was Fredkin Zeitlin and a book binder and collaborators. Oh, I should say there are a couple of review sources. There's a monograph by Avramidi called Heat Kernel in Quantum Gravity, which doesn't sound like it's about this, but it's all about this. This is thesis. Uh, and there's a second one. There's a book by Buchbinder, Odinsoff, uh, and Shapiro called Effective Action in Quantum Gravity, about which uh, the last half of the book is devoted to the discussion of this theory. I should say about that in citing this, that it's a good book uh, conceptually, but it's full of misprints. You can't take any formulas from there. I talked to Shapiro about it. It had to do with, yeah, never mind. So Mark, Marty, why do you use three terms in, in the action yeah, there? I'll, I'll come back okay. to that. Um, Is it unitary? Oh, of course, if you, you can add uh, an Einstein-Hilbert term and a cosmological constant if you want. Those are ultraviolet irrelevant operators. They're not going to destroy renormalizability. But uh, it won't destroy if the behavior of the dimensionless couplings in the theory, like these. But it does create some problems with unitarity because, uh, well, this is a fourth order action and the propagator looks like one over Q fourth at very large scales. 
And if you add this term, you'll quickly see that the tensor, that the metric ha looks sort of like this. So either you have a graviton and a ghost, or vice versa. <laughs> the graviton is the ghost. And so that's bad news. Uh, people sort of dispensed with this, I think, after that. That was one thing that happened. But that one is a little bit faulty because this is a theory which is perfectly good at infinite momentum, so to say. That's an infrared problem. How many times have we gotten ourselves in trouble by thinking we understood the infrared? And we didn't. That's what I'll be talking about today. Um, In your conventions, what's the correct side of the propagator? Excuse me? In your conventions, what's the correct side of the propagator? It's the one that gives a, a real gravity. Okay, so that's the <laughs> But I'll use a Euclidean metric throughout the stuff. Why do you call this infrared problem? Uh, what? Why do you call this infrared problem? It's uh, existence. Because, because at infinite Q squared, it's perfectly sensible and renormalizable. Yeah. And then you, and then you add some terms, and at m squared far below where it's asymptotically free, yeah. you ran into problems. These are infrared. I mean, right? These are infrared relevant, ultraviolet irrelevant. That's why I call it an infrared. Martin, what I don't understand about what you've just said is that if I take the UV theory, okay. Um, do you have a, a Hilbert space construction that, so take the free UV theory, which you say the thing flows to in the UV. So that, that's the quadratic expansion of this thing with mm -hmm. the Q to the fourth. Yeah. And I would believe what you're saying if you told me that you had a, for that theory, a Hilbert space of, you know, of the complete set of states and so on. So I don't know. Did anybody ever do that? Not as no. Far as I'm aware. No. Uh, what Stella did was simply expand about a flat background and calculate. No, I, and, I, I understand. And what it means to go on shell, I don't know. And what it's not like the usual theories. You could probably rewrite this as two second order instead of one fourth order, but it's different. I agree. And I don't fully, there are many things I don't understand. And I don't understand what the spectrum of the theory is in uh, this form. OK? But I do understand it in other forms, I think. OK. Uh, sorry. Can I, um, so if you assume the graviton propagator is well defined, then demanding that it has a positive residue in Q squared at zero uh, Q squared, uh, would uh, force you to have negative residue somewhere. Uh, well, well, one way to uh, evade that, because I mean, you be in the, you know, by the counter argument, mm -hmm. so, by, by the counter argument. Mm -hmm. So, so the one way to evade that would be say there are no baritone states. Um, uh, okay, like, so uh, let, let me talk a little about the classical theory. Okay, so we started here with a classical, a classical scale invariant Lagrangian. Now, classical in quantum field theory, classical is almost a misnomer, right? Because these are supposed to be renormalized coupling constants. So you have to say what scale you're at and all these other things. But let me speak classically anyway. So this is classically scale invariant. And in fact, it's confining. That is, the potential would be the Fourier transform of d3q e to the minus iq dot x, which is linear, right? If you just count powers. So classically, if you don't add these mass terms, this won't look much like general relativity, but Presumably, it confines somehow. And I don't want to go into what that means, because I don't 
want to get there. <laughs> I want to get to general relativity somehow. But classically, it's, it's funny. It's a lot like QCD, except QCD doesn't have a classical confinement. It has a quantum confinement. And of course, asymptotic freedom is a quantum effect uh, in any case. Now, of course, the classical scale invariance is anomalous. Uh, the beta functions are not zero for these theories. But as Bill Bardeen has emphasized over the years, the symmetry breaking due to the anomaly is actually soft. It doesn't introduce power divergences into the theory. They're just logs. Uh, he's resuscitated this in models of the weak scale in recent times. But in any case, um, this theory, as it stands, and, the, and its extension to matter, which is classically scale invariant, is actually technically natural just like supersymmetric theories. I'll argue that you don't need to add any masses to make sense of this. There has been work, as long as I'm speaking historically, about whether there might be a conformal limit of this where you just have the vial term. Um, and Strominger worked on that. So Gary and Malcolm Perry. And this has nothing to do with my talk. I just wanted to mention that heresy is not foreign to some people you know. <laughs> OK. So here's an outline of my talk. I want to, I want to go back over Coleman-Weinberg in flat space, but I'll do it uh, probably in a different way than you may have seen uh, in order to emphasize the features that will be translatable into a theory like this. And then I'll talk about dimensional transmutation in this theory, and then about dimensional transmutation if you add the simplest form of matter, a real scalar. And then, if we want an asymptotically free theory, we'll need to add, if we're going to gauge it, we need to add Yang-Mills uh, interactions. And I'll talk, if I have time, about that. And we've done some work on SO10. I should say that some work along those lines was done already by a bookbinder and others a long, a long time ago. OK, so let me start with the Coleman-Weinberg model which is just scalar electrodynamics. And I'll use a Euclidean signature and you know factor, numerical factors I'll forget about. I shouldn't forget coupling constants. So. Uh, and um, so they started with scalar electrodynamics. Um, Now, in a quantum theory, what you want to do, if you could, is calculate what's called the effective action, which um, is a function of the coupling constants and the fields. And in perturbation theory, it looks like the classical action plus a one loop correction. And the one loop correction is actually very simple. It has this sort of form. OK, 16 pi squared is equal to 1. As are all other numbers, pretty much, except when I need them. Uh, so here you have the form of the one loop effective action, the potential. Well, the action, if I integrate, put it in here and integrate. OK. 
And you need to sum over all the masses in the theory, including the vector boson masses. They acquire masses of order e squared, mass squared of order e squared phi squared, if phi uh, isn't zero. And then there are scalar masses and, and so forth. You need to sum them. So m squared here is like the second derivative of phi. Well, phi is complex, so it's actually a matrix. But let's, I can go into that if you want. But, and you also have the vector bosons. And uh, in general, extrema occur where the variation of effective a action vanishes. And so you look for places where it vanishes. And if you really want to understand it, you need to calculate the second derivatives to show at that point you have stability. Uh, in other language, um, this is just the mass of the diloton, mass squared of the diloton. OK. This uh, effective action obeys the renormalization group equation, which in a general form looks like this. If you have many fields, you would sum over the fields. If you have many coupling constants, you sum over the beta functions, and that's zero. Now, as well known, this actually relates different orders of perturbation theory. For example, if I put, if I write S as, if I write gamma as S plus a correction term, mu d d mu comes from this correction term. So that's just this matrix or trace of the, it's actually the super trace of the matrix m to the fourth. And then you have plus beta and lambda, one loop, minus anomalous dimensions. On the classical potential. So the one loop, mu d d mu of the one loop is given by the beta, one loop beta functions acting on the classical potential. So you can calculate, even if you didn't know how to do it a priori, you can calculate the super trace if you know the beta functions. And if you go on shell, that is where dd phi is, uh, is 0, then on shell it's just the beta functions, which are gauge invariant. So keep that in mind as I go through. The next step. Now, Coleman and Weinberg calculated the effective potential, which I wrote here. So this is really times the, an integral dx of the volume. And they wanted to know where the effective potential vanished. So if I take the derivative of the classical potential, and look at the derivative of m fourth log m squared, I get, after a little algebra, dm squared d phi times something like m squared plus log plus m squared log m squared. In other words, it's basically dm fourth d phi times, times this. And you look for a place where this vanishes to find extrema. 
Well, the m fourth d phi, you know something about m fourth. You know that m fourth, or at least the trace of m fourth, is beta d d lambda on shell, so that I can write this as times the classical action. equals uh, times, well, this thing gets multiplied by 1 plus log. So let's deal with the log. This, it's convenient to choose a normalization scale so that this log vanishes, or the sum over the logs vanish, which we'll do. So we choose mu to be some scale, which is at or close to where the minimum is. And then this log goes away. And so you're just left with this equation. So you don't need to calculate any loops if somebody tells you the one-loop beta functions, which these fellows did in the 80s. OK, so um, what did Coleman and Weinberg do? Well, this term is just a lambda phi cubed. And all the masses, there's no other scale in the problem, so all the masses which are calculated from the classical uh, action are proportional to phi. So this is also going to, the m fourth log m squared term in the potential is also m to the fourth. And you can see that here. This is, in this theory, we just have potential lambda phi to the fourth. So you get. Oh, there's something not quite right. Oh, I forgot this derivative with respect to phi. Yes. So we get a derivative with respect to phi of lambda phi fourth, which is, again, phi cubed. So we get beta lambda, dd lambda of the mass to the fourth term, which is, again, for phi cubed. So we just get an equation that looks like this. Lambda plus beta of lambda equals 0 at, at the minimum or extremum. So I want you to remember this equation. That's uh, the Coleman-Weinberg equation. And and of course, you think, well, you can't get anywhere with this because usually the beta function is down by loop factors compared to lambda. But they had the foresight to realize that when you have a theory with more than one coupling constant, not ain't necessarily so. So what does this beta function look like? Well, the beta function for lambda gets a term that goes like lambda squared, right, from things like these loops. And you get a term like lambda e squared from things like these loops. And you get an e fourth term that goes from things like th these loops. So if it should happen that at this scale, where there's an extremum, lambda is of order e squared, say, or well, then these all terms would all be the same. So if lambda is smaller than e squared, then this term dominates. And then this term, this equation, reads something like lambda plus the beta function of the, the contribution to the beta function from e fourth equals 0, with some coefficient here that depends on whatever the actual beta function is. Now, I wrote a, some signs here, even though I left off the factors. This uh, sign will turn out later to be rather important, but not here. So what you're going to get out of this is an equation that says lambda at 
some scale, call it v, plus some coefficient, some number, times e fourth equals 0. That number actually turns out to be positive, so that this scale is actually where lambda is negative. And some people conclude that's a problem, because um, you might think the theory is unstable or something. But that's just the way it is at this scale. At large scales, lambda turns positive again, and there's no problem. OK, well, since my time is limited, I, maybe I'll skip exactly how you show that this is a perfectly natural thing to happen. What you do is you start, you want to solve these, you want to look at the running of these couplings. So you want to solve <coughs> call it the e squared this equation together with the d lambda d lambda equation and show that as the thing runs, it's perfectly natural for the thing to pass through a range where lambda is very small and negative so that uh, this equation can be satisfied. When you have a coupling that like this, which is monotonic, it's useful to trade t is log mu, the normalization scale. It's useful if you have a monotonically running coupling to use that rather than t to describe the running. And of course, if I divide these, I get d lambda d e squared. That, that, so that it's really simpler to analyze the theory if I rescale in general. If I rescale the coupling like by taking out a factor of e squared and writing an equation for beta of y, um, that goes like e squared times something I'll call beta bar of y, which is a function of y and e squared only. That is, it's a function of the Actually, it's a function of y only. So you can sort of solve the equation once you know how e squared runs and find what I said. Namely, although y is generically of order e squared, it passes through a region where it's small. So that was the Coleman-Weinberg thing. We will reproduce all of that in the quantum gravity case. Now, people looked at more complicated models, of course, especially when in grand unified theories. You have many more fields, many more couplings, but the equations are still the same, namely, you need to, to satisfy an equation that looks sort of like this. Now, what happens in more complicated models, just to say a few words about guts, is that there are often in these potentials, we don't have any scales in the potentials now. They're all dimensionless coupling constants. These potentials frequently have flat directions, where if you go a certain direction in the field space, the potential doesn't change. That direction can be de determined from the classical potential. If you've ever seen guts discussed, you're familiar with that. So what happens in those cases is that the derivative of the classical potential with respect to the field, if you rewrite it as a function of the ratio of fields, that's all it is. It's a di I mean, action, the action is dimensionless. So it can only be a function of the dimensionless coupling constants and ratios of fields. The ratios determine classically, but the field value is not, just like in Coleman-Weinberg. You have to go to one loop to get the field value. But you don't have this term anymore. But you do have the second term. 
So the equation that you're going to want to satisfy in that case is that the sum over the couplings times the beta functions of the derivative evaluated at the, where the ratio of some fields, maybe many, has some certain value is 0. This is the generalization of Coleman Weinberg. To cases where you're running in a flat direction that's stable. Okay, in in grand unified theories, the again you get beta of g squared. In this case, it's famously minus this. So the coupling of g squared is asymptotically free. And for other couplings, you get similar things uh, like we got there, lambda squared minus lambda g squared plus g to the fourth. And I put these signs because they always work out sort of like that. I mean, there are more couplings and stuff. And the point is, if you want the beta function for the other couplings to go to be negative, so they're asymptotically free, this term has to win, which is a strong constraint on the coefficients. And you have to be, you have, you'll find that unless you're careful, I mean, it's hard to get scalar couplings to be asymptotically free. And you, but you can. And typically, it happens for theories like SUN or SON. It happens in a, for theories in which n is large. Like here, it happens for n bigger than uh, or equal to 8, I think it is. No, 7, I think. And here, it's for n bigger than 8. So you have to have fairly large gauge groups. Uh, and some people don't like that. You also have to have the beta function for the gauge coupling to be rather slowly varying so that this term can win, so to say. So it's like walking. You need theories in which the beta functions, the, this coefficient is small. That constrains the spectrum of the theory, too. So it's interesting. People didn't like that because it required special arrangements. But I sort of like it after I get used to it. Because it tells you that once you pick the gauge group, there are strong constraints on the spectrum of, of the other particles in the theory and their couplings. OK, so let me come to uh, a, a short form of this that we'll use with quantum gravity. So the effective action looks like the classical action. And then basically, let's sum it all up. We get a term that isn't, doesn't appear classically in these cases, like flat directions and so forth. And then you get another term involving this, this squared log. And we saw that we can calculate this from the one loop beta functions. This is a two loop effect. But it provides. What? What is phi now? Oh, it's some generic field, sorry. It's, for example, it's, it's just you've written the theory as a function of dimensionless ratios of fields. Pick one of them, and if it's, if that's, and then just try to determine. Are you doing the gravity now? Ah, no, 
I'll You're not doing that. I'll, no, I'll come back to it. Okay. Uh, actually, I'll do the same thing, but I'm not doing gravity yet. Okay. So to understand the second derivative of the potential at the place where B vanishes, we need to do a two loop calculation, which is the harder. OK, so let's, uh, let me turn back to renormalizable gravity. Uh, first of all, one should understand that the metric here isn't ju doesn't just have a tensor piece. It also has a scalar piece. It's, uh, this is really like a scalar tensor theory. The scalar piece is usually associated with the trace. But, and, uh, but setting that aside, people sometimes like to write this in terms of a scalar by rewriting R squared in terms of an auxiliary field, right? So you can write R plus H sigma over 2 squared. Add an auxiliary field, cancel the R term, and you get an H sigma R plus minus a squared sigma squared over 4. And so you can rewrite this in terms of an auxiliary field. It's really tricky to renormalize when you do that, but you can get away with it. It has the wrong sign if you think of it as a potential, but auxiliary fields don't have to have the right sign and so forth. I'm not going to do that, but it illustrates that in this theory, if this were to get a VEV, this would like be like a negative cosmological constant, and this would be sort of like the Planck mass. So it illustrates how the theory might realize some physics. OK. OK, as uh, John asked, why did I write it like this? So let me explain. Well, I wrote it like that. People usually only write two of those three terms. The reason being that there's a linear combination of these invariants, which is like uh, the YL squared minus 2W. I say that because Fradkin and Seitman put it like this. Times R mu nu minus a 12th. R squared, I think it is. Yeah, plus a 6 R squared minus 2 times the traceless part, the Ricci tensor squared. This thing is called the gauss bonnet invariant. It can also, in four dimensions, be written it's equal to the square of the dual to the Riemann tensor. And it can also be written as the derivative, covariant derivative of B mu. And th this is not a vector. This is a one form, actually. It trans it's not a gauge invariant. So you have to be a little careful about that. But when you integrate, because when you integrate it, this thing is equal to the integral, right? It's going to be some sort of surface term or something. It's equal to 32 pi squared times the Euler characteristic. So it depends on the topology of the space you're integrating over. But the point is, it's an invariant. It's locally. It looks like a total derivative. Globally, it actually can give a non-zero contribution. However, the fact that it locally looks like a total derivative means that the variation of its contribution is zero, independent of the equations of motion. It's always zero. So, when people write the Feynman rules for this, they like to 
uh, take that into account. So typically they'll write something like times the Gauss Binet. Okay. Uh, and then the Feynman rules are formulated in terms of these. This doesn't contribute to the Feynman rules. But it's really very tricky. I was confused a long time because the literature is confusing. In fact, papers are self-contradictory, like these and these, where they say you can ignore it, but then later, suddenly, there's a beta function for this coefficient. Uh, and that's true. Namely, when you start to calculate loop corrections, starting from Feynman rules that only involve A and B, you find three types of tensors. So you wind up having to renormalize this term as well. So beta of C is not zero, even though you didn't use them in the final rules. Well, that's all well and good, but how do you really calculate? People like dimensional regularization, don't they? In fact, that's the way they calculate. Or with equivalent, essentially equivalent, use some sort of zeta function. But you go away from four dimensions. Now, away from four dimensions, you don't have any of this. So you think you'd need three couplings to start with. Can you get away without that? I couldn't figure that out, so I wrote a paper about it. And we showed that the, the coupling for this is actually a function of the other coupling, such that this beta function is equal to, satisfies this equation. So I can just use the couplings A and B and infer the beta function for C when I get back to four dimensions. So you can get away with dimensional regularization is what the, the message is. Did you do that by just computing it and showing that this was true, or did you have an a priori argument for it? Uh, we computed it and showed it order by order. Uh, that is, iteratively, right? And I can tell you what it is later if you want to know. C is determined by this equation up to an overall renormalization group invariant constant. And I don't know if that's an observable or not. But anyway, so that's a word about the gauss binet You mustn't neglect the beta function. For the, you mustn't throw away that term, in other words. Another way to see that is this. Suppose I were. Sorry, but this is expected, right? Because you're just saying that C0 cannot enter the beta function. What? That's basically what I'm saying. You're saying the shift of C by a constant yeah. cannot enter beta function. Right. And once you know that's true, then this will follow. Yeah, but you have to show that it's true. No, no. Isn't, isn't this obvious? I had to show. Because, I mean, in general, you can always write, uh, if you follow along, along our trajectory, you can always try to rewrite some coupling in terms of other You companies. can try. That's a scheme that Zimmerman and Ome tried. No, no, back but I'm in saying that you, in, that, in that case, you, you put don't, more parameters. What they did was look for solutions in, their own, in the space of couplings where equations like this were true. Okay, they tried to get dynamical constraints on the theory by looking for reduction in the number of coupling constants. But that's not what I'm doing here. I'm saying that because of the scouse binet theorem, this is a function of these, and you have to prove it. No, but, but I'm saying that. I think that just followed from the, the fact that the, these beta functions do not, not depend on constant shifts of C. Well, what, is the one loop correct, what is the one loop beta function for C? Um, well, I'm, um, 
I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you later. You write the beta function a priori as a function of the three couplings, and then you impose the fact that, in fact, it can't depend on is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Uh, C. Then you get that it's a function of A. Yeah, well, this is what people actually did. If you go back to Craig's Fadkin and Seitling, what they did is they'd calculate the one loop, say, divergences. They'd renormalize this, but they never said that. See, but they actually did it that way. So we tried to make it formalize. We won't make it formal to show that why, to so to say why that happened. Okay, you'll see in a minute because when I, I will now come to normalizable quantum gravity uh, in this form, say. And I'll quantize the theory by uh, using a background field gauge, background field method, which is pretty much universally done. Uh, and uh, the one that I'll work with, for the most part, is a, a, a background that classically is, say, the sitter space which has a large global symmetry for, but for which uh, the curvature is a constant. Now you see from the Gauss-Binet relation that g is r squared over 6. In the sitter space, this is 0 and this is 0. So you see, you would have made a mistake if you could thought you could throw that away classically. The classical action, well, what is the classical action? It's dimensionless. So it can't depend on R at all. So classically, it's just a function of A and B and C, but C I don't need to write. Uh, and the way that comes about, of course, is that the integral of the volume is set by the scale of the curvature. So when you do these integrals, well, in the sitter background, this doesn't contribute. And this gives a 1 over b. And this gives a c over 6. And so the classical action is just those numbers, or couplings, actually. So, so this the sitter background is a solution of, of the equations? Yes. In fact, most solutions that you know, somebody, there's a paper, I forgot the author. Most solutions that you know are also solutions of this theory. Friedman, Robinson, Walker, and, and so forth. Black holes haven't been analyzed, but they probably are so, also solutions when, when all is said and done. I'm not done. OK, well. I want to know, I've got two coupling constants, even though this one depends on the others. I've got two coupling constants, A and B. Can I find a place where dimensional transmutation occurs? That is, can I find, can I calculate the coefficient of that log? Can I find a place where that vanishes? Well, that's just minus beta of b over b squared plus beta of c over 6. Uh, and uh, as I said, these one loop beta functions were calculated long ago. So I can put them in. So let me tell you first how things run. So, uh, DDT of A, on which this implicitly depends, is equal to minus some coupling alcohol B, 
E2, I'll call it, because that's what it tends to be called in the literature, or beta 2. It's a constant that, I know, that we can know, but we don't need to know it right now. So A is asymptotically free. The running of C turns out to be a constant. And the running of B is um, Let me check my conventions here. Yeah. Yeah, minus. But this is a function of A and B. Namely, it's A squared times a function of the ratio X, where X is B over A. OK? So this equation up here winds up looking like something like B3 of X and B is proportional to X or x squared minus b1 equals 0. So it's not. So that's where dimensional transmutation would take place if it exists. But first, they need to check that this is asymptotically free. So I won't go through that. But in the way I showed you, you can calculate dx dt. You trade t for a dt, and then you'll find that this is a function of x alone. And it's just a quadratic function. It's like minus 10 thirds plus a constant, a certain constant, minus 5 twelfths. X squared, it looks like this. <coughs> so the beta function for x, the ratio of b to a, has a uv fixed point over here and an ir fixed point over here. So asymptotically, x goes to a constant. And this is typical. Ratios of couplings typically approach fixed points. You must show that the fixed points are ultraviolet attractive, which this is here. So it goes to a constant, positive constant. So that means <laughs> since A goes to 0 by this equation, B, which is x times A, also goes to 0 in the same way as A. And so this theory has, is asymptotically free. So then you can turn to this equation and solve it. Well, V3 is just this quadratic. It's almost like calculating a fixed point. It's just shifted by the gauss binet factor. And you can solve it. And you find a single, it has one positive root, one negative root. It turns out it sort of looks like this. So you can find a place where dimensional transmutation does occur. So what would you like to know? You'd like to know, is it stable, at least locally? But that requires two loops, going to two loops, right? And as I said, you have to calculate this, this term I called too many Cs. But I calculate, it, it's the two loop contribution. Nobody's, I don't know if anybody's even attempted to calculate the two loop thing. I mean, if you have a graduate student who's independently funded and doesn't want to ever finish, <laughs> this is a problem you could give them. Calculate the two loop beta functions in this theory, really. Now, I'm old and don't have the stamina I once had. In fact, if I took this problem up, I'd be dead before I finished. <laughs> Isn't your collaborator named Tulip Joe? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he goes by that nickname, but even he shudders. And he's calculated four loops in, in Yang Mill's theory. But even he shudders. 
I know the answer. It turns out. I don't have time to explain right now. <laughs> secretly, <laughs> secretly, well, I don't. I'm running out of time. Secretly, I'll tell you the answer. They're all uns this point is unstable. This theory does not have a stable local minimum. So it doesn't look good unless you like inflationary models, which work off a maximum. Some people do, but you have to calculate it. So this term called C, uh, I'll write it again. We seem to have erased it. So I got S, S classical plus V log. Ah, I didn't tell you what I did. OK. I shortcut it. What I did when I wrote this down, see, S didn't depend, S was just this here. Didn't depend on rho. So I took rho to be something like the square root of r. Or you could use, well, that's about all you have in the sitter. And then you calculate. And you find the value of rho where the dimensional transportation occurs. But this is the scale. This tells you whether it's a minimum or a maximum, where b is 0. So you got to go calculate a two-loop contribution. This is the mass of the diloton, mass squared. We can do it, but I haven't got time to explain it. OK, so let me, I'm not going to finish, but I'll t give you the flavor of it. The second thing we did was uh, look at what happens if you add a scalar field. It's quite interesting. So if, if for matter you write you write matter like this, you get you have two more coupling constants. So you have four all together. After you take their ratios and stuff, you have an equation for fixed points involving three. But the point is that if you can find a scale where dimensional transmutation occurs, you'll generate something that looks like the Planck mass squared and something that looks like a cosmological constant. So that's interesting, I think. It's technically natural. You said dimensional transmutation, but do you just mean, is that the same as saying that phi gets a VEV? Phi gets a VEV? Phi gets a VEV through a, because of a certain special relation that has to obtain among couple, dimensionless coupling constants. Because of a relation. OK. It's like this equation, lambda plus e fourth equals 0, 6 pi squared. OK. That's all we have. Dimensionless couplings. Well, if at some scale that equation can be satisfied, then that's a physical scale. It's like lambda QCD or, or Coleman-Weinberg scale. So starting from a dimensionless a theory without any dimensionful parameters, you can calculate whether or not the symmetry is broken. OK. I'll tell you the answer to this theory. It does have fixed points. In fact, we found six. And one of them is asymptotically free, stable. That is attractive. And for b equals 0, we found, look, there's b equals 0 is equation among three coupling constants. It's simple to find the solution to b equals 0. It's just like polynomials. So it's easy to find dimensional transmutation. But it fails, even without knowing C, it fails. We were able to show that the places where dimensional trans where the asymptotically free fixed point was was not in the basin of attraction. Uh, right, sorry. The place where the symmetry breaking occurred 
was not in the basin of attraction of the asymptotically free fixed point. It was in a different phase of the theory altogether. So it didn't work. Stuck again. So that's when we started looking at Yang Mills theory. And we knew from guts that there are asymptotically free gut theories. And we knew from this work that if you take some of those theories and you add gravity, it's still asymptotically free. Whether the, but nobody looked at the dimension, this question of whether you could not write any masses. People always put in a minus m squared r plus cosmos. So we looked at, we're looking at v1 equals zero. And the model we chose to do, which hadn't been done before, is SO10 plus uh, scalar field in the adjoint representation. That can break SO10 to SU5 cross U1. There are solutions to V1 equals zero. Dimensional transportation can occur and does break SO10, can break SO10 down to SU5 cross U1. So I calculated a gut scale, height mass, and a cosmological constant. Not too shabby, right? In fact, we know there's a kind of small hierarchy here because the mass squared of the diloton is two loops. It's order, actually, it's a times <coughs> the function of the dimensionless couplings, but it's order h bar squared. It's light. It's like all of these coleman weinberg type models. The scalar is relatively light. I mean, if the unification scale were 10 to the 16, this would be probably around 10 to the 12, a number that you hear a lot in seminars where inflation or neutrino masses or something happens. So it's very tantalizing. Uh, what about this multiple constant? It it's probably going to be big. Yeah. Uh, but this is what the universe would have looked like. And there's a continuum of these, by the way. This is what the universe would have looked like before inflation. This is before you, the Planck mass existed. But then we generate them. I, we haven't finished the calculation of whether any of these are stable. I mean, it takes a page to write the formula, but Mathematica, even Mathematica chokes. So we haven't finished that. So I don't know yet if any of them are stable and go to the asymptotically free fixed point, but I think it's very likely. So there's a lot to do. There's a lot of long hanging, low hanging fruit if you buy any of this. Yeah. So your pessimistic conclusion there, is that just a function of being about, expanding about the sitter, if you expand it about something else? I mean, it's not the worst to have to sitter be unstable. Excuse me? Not necessarily the worst to have to sitter. Well, I haven't. Stable. But if you, would this locally, be stable about any other backgrounds? Could you? We haven't done that. In fact, it's, it's the opposite of supergravity. It's hard. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's really hard to find a negative cosmological constant. I haven't had time to talk about it, but they're constrained. See, these series are asymptotically free. So at very high scale, the classical action is a good approximation. So the Euclidean Feynman path integral better converge at very high scales. So there are inequalities that have to be satisfied. We check that they are where these uh, fixed points occur. So you say that basically the sitter is the right one to do. The sitter works. I don't up. know if I can make an anti de sitter yeah. solution. I wouldn't be surprised there's some way, but I don't know. It's not so clear. Um, there's a zillion things, a zillion questions I have, including uh, whether the theory is unitary, which I can come back to. 
below the Planck scale, it'll be very hard to tell the difference if it's not. But I don't know yet. And um, I don't know what the spectrum looks above the Planck scale. It's this one over two fourth thing, which is, you know, a departure from ordinary quantum field theory. But What's the, uh, it seems to work. I was remembering um, the name Terry Tomboulis. I just looked up what I thought he did something about unitarity of art, which he did. So what's your take on that whole he, work? He is basically showing what I said at the beginning. If you add these mass terms, you're in trouble. If you add if you add an Einstein Hilbert term, yeah. you'll get ghosts. Huh. But his abstract says uh, the general fourth order action. Yeah. Is unitary. Well, I don't. Th oh, is unitary. Yeah. Oh, I forgot. Yeah. Is it on a lattice? Yeah, I saw that. Yes, I saw that. Well, I don't want to say uh, right now what I think of that proof. We can talk privately. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, sorry. Uh, I, uh, the, the, the problem with the unitarity there. I thought it wasn't uh, adding the mass term or not, but rather the assumption that there's a Minkowski vacuum and the one gravitational state that would be right to contradiction. Yeah, I suspect this theory doesn't make sense in Minkowski space strictly, but I'm not sure. Uh, can I just try to understand the conclusion of the theory without the, the matter? Are you saying that this, this effective action admits the theory solution? Was that the? It admits. Uh, solutions to dimensional transportation, but they're all unstable locally. Unstable, I and it's the best I can do. If you just add some kind of fine-tuned cosmological constant term that doesn't allow you to go to a, have a, a Minkowski solution. Yeah, then you're doing something else, which I don't want to do. But you can do it. <laughs> I mean, I just don't want to get into a natural fine-tuning. now. You can ask me, even if I believe this, what happens below the gut scale? It doesn't solve the, uh, this theory would not solve, I think, the electroweak naturalness problem. I mean, I remember from guts that the light masses at the electroweak scale get corrections that go like the unification mass squared. So I'm stuck. I'm not advertising that this solves the naturalness problem that people usually talk about. But maybe there's some way. Another thing one could do is ask, what's, what's a supersymmetric generalization of this? And could, you, could, you, could dimensional transmutation preserve some supersymmetries in such a way that the, it's supersymmetric down to the weak scale or somewhere thereabouts? I don't know the answer. I don't even know what the. <coughs> If anybody knows a supersymmetric form of this, I'd like to know a reference. Because I don't, I don't know what it looks like. Okay. So this choice of uh, the scale you said mu is equal just in the coleman weinberg example. What's the importance of picking that scale? You said that you want to minimize the logs, right? Excuse me? You said you want to minimize the logs or to make the logs vanish? No, I want to find a minimum to the effective potential. Okay. And I want to do it in a way that's self-consistent, that is, in which the calculation is justified. And that Coleman Weinberg taught us how to do that. Okay? I'd like it to be a local minimum. See, in lambda phi fourth, the potential winds up looking like this. And you can prove it's zero lambda phi fourth. This is what they call a renormalization group improved. But you get it out of this. It looks like this. It works. I don't know yet whether I can draw a similar picture for Yang Mills, but we'll get there. Uh, in that example with uh, gravity and scalar field, um, so the point of the, of the dimensional transmutation uh, you have a scale which is the scalar field, the value of the scalar, and uh, you have also a curvature, so like two different scales. They're linked. Do, do, do you get the same order, or yeah. you can get a higher? Yeah. Thing? 
Well, you can get a kind of higher. That's a good question. You can sort of get a hierarchy because what happens is that the ratio of the scalar field to the curvature, if you if you solve, see what this equation says. It says lambda. If I call this r, it says lambda r squared minus c r. This is the classical action as a function of the ratio. Is, is that's just that. So you can minimize that, right? So r is c over lambda. So it's a question of whether among the continuum of solutions, there are theories where this ratio is especially large or especially small. And it, in fact, it actually goes, it tends, this is, uh, that's probably confusing. After, with these, these rescaled things go to a constant, and this thing gets large. But the thing that enters here is a times r squared and a times r. I'd, ha I'd have to go through it with you, but it's, it's not a problem. And yes, there are many, in theories of many parameters, there may well be ratios of couplings that are lar uh, small. But I'd like to get one simple model that works, that I know works uh, first. And then, I mean, the, the, the algebra is just horrendous, especially when you come to two loops. But, but it would be worth it if I thought it would be worth it. Any other questions? Okay, thanks again.